affectionately known as the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean, Montserrat has had a turbulent economic history over the past four decades. Economic activity slowed down in the 1980s, following rapid growth in the 70s. In the 1990s, Montserrat faced a significant challenge to economic growth and development with the eruption of the Sufria Hills volcano. Growth resumed in the 2000s as volcanic activity waned and the country sought to repair critical infrastructure. To further spur economic activity, the government of Montserrat is pursuing the development of an ICT innovation center to serve as a hub for innovation and technology development. The launch of the new subsea fiber optic cable system in 2020, which provides reliable high-speed internet access after a 20-year hiatus, offers an opportunity to leverage the new technology to diversify Montserrat's economy. These developments can accelerate the provision of more electronic services to residents and provide the opportunity to explore other services such as e-commerce, distance education, and telemedicine. The result is improved efficiency in all aspects of society, which could substantially improve the lives of residents while reducing costs. It is against this backdrop that we invite you to engage with us as we discuss the promise of information and communication technologies on this, the ECCB's 40th Anniversary Lecture Series, the Munstrat Edition. The Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, ECCB, celebrates 40 years of transformative leadership and innovation. The ECCB has been diligently fulfilling its mission of advancing the good of the people of the currency union for 40 years by maintaining monetary and financial stability and promoting growth and development. It is the monetary authority for a population of more than 600,000 people spanning six sovereign states, Antigua and Barbuda, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, St. Christopher, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and two overseas territories of the United Kingdom, Anguilla and Montserrat. On October 1st, 1983, the East Caribbean Currency Authority, ECCA, was upgraded to a central bank, the ECCB. The ECCB's predecessor, the ECCA, had been established in 1965 to issue and manage EC currency after its predecessor, the British Caribbean Currency Board, dissolved in 1964 when Guyana and Trinidad and Tobago withdrew membership to form their own central banks. Shortly after Barbados signaled its intention to withdraw from the ECCA and establish its own central bank, the West Indies Associated States Council of Ministers decided to move the headquarters of the East Caribbean Currency Authority to St. Kitts. One year after Barbados's withdrawal, ECCA's headquarters transferred to St. Kitts on May 20th, 1975, situated at the corner of Central and Church Streets. The move to St. Kitts was overseen by the Managing Director of the ECCA, Sir Cecil Jacobs, a national of St. Kitts and Nevis. The next year, on July 7, 1976, the EC dollar was pegged to the US dollar at a fixed rate of EC $2.70 to US $1. Nearly seven years later to the day, on July 5, 1983, seven governments signed the agreement establishing the ECCB as the monetary authority, with Anguilla eventually signing on as a full member on April 1, 1987. On October 1, 1983, the ECCB was officially commissioned and operated out of the former ECCA headquarters. Three months later, the first meeting of the Monetary Council established in accordance with Article 7 of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Agreement was held on January 20, 1984. 
Sir Cecil Jacobs, who was then the first governor of the ECCB, led an initial staff of 55 persons. He was ably assisted by Sir Errol Allen, a Vincentian who served as deputy governor until his retirement on March 31, 2005. The first ECCB agency office was established in Grenada on November 1, 1984, paving the way for the expansion of the ECCB's footprint to all its member countries. On October 1, 1987, the ECCB agency office in St. Lucia was established, followed by one in Dominica on November 1, 1989, and one in St. Vincent and the Grenadines on April 1, 1990, with the remaining ECCB agency offices opening up the next year, Montserrat on March 4, 1991, then Anguilla on May 23, and Antigua and Barbuda on June 15, 1991. On November 21, 1992, a ceremony was held to break ground for the construction of the new ECCB headquarters at Bird Rock. The bank moved into its new headquarters in August 1994 and it was officially opened on October 29 that year. Sir Cecil Jacobs retired in September 1989 and Sir K. Dwight Venner of Vincentian became governor of the ECCB from December 1, 1989 and served until his retirement in November 2015. The present governor, Mr. Timothy N.J. Antoine, a Grenadian, assumed the role on February 1, 2016. The year 2022 was a year of recognition for the ECCB. The ECCB introduced polymer notes in 2019 and won the best new banknote series from reconnaissance. Come October 1st, the date that the ECCB was put into force 40 years ago, the ECCB headquarters will be entirely carbon neutral. This is thanks to a solar canopy project started in 2017, which was recognized with the Central Banking 2022 Green Initiative Award. Ever in the vanguard of innovation, the ECCB on March 31st 2021 introduced Dcash, the first central bank digital currency CBDC to be launched by a currency union. As the ECCB enters its 40th year, the governor is adeptly supported by the institution's first female deputy governor, Dr. Valda F. Henry, a national of the Commonwealth of Dominica, and Ms. D. Tracy Polius, a national of St. Lucia, who serves as chief director policy. Dr. Henry succeeded Mr. Trevor Brathwaite of St. Lucia, who served as the second deputy governor from 2006 to 2021. There is no way to fit all that the ECCB is, does, and means for the people of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, ECCU, into this historical reel. You are therefore invited to log on to the ECCB's virtual museum when it launches later this year to get a full-fledged history of this pioneering central bank. The leadership and staff of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank proudly celebrate the bank's 40th Ruby anniversary and dedicate this year of festivities to you the people of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union. Your Excellency, Mrs. Sarah Tucker, Governor of Montserrat, and guest, Dr. Vijay Rangarajan, Director General of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office with responsibility for the overseas territories, Dr. the Honorable Samuel Joseph, Acting Premier of Montserrat, and the first speaker for this evening's lecture. Honorable Charlene White, Speaker of the Montserrat Legislative Assembly, Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, the ECCB, Mr. Timothy N.J. Antoine, Dr. Valda Henry, Deputy Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, other ECCU officials across the region, distinguished panelist, Mr. Denzel West, Director, Department of Information and E-Government Services, 
board members of the Bank of Montserrat and the St. Patrick's Cooperative Credit Union Limited, heads of departments, Dikash Business Support Team in Montserrat, Mr. Manish Valecha and Mr. Jayesh Sadwani, permanent secretaries, members of the media, students from the Montserrat Community College and the Montserrat Secondary School, distinguished invited guests, esteemed ladies and gentlemen joining us online. A warm Caribbean spirit welcome and a pleasant evening to you all on behalf of the executive of the ECCB. Today, you are part of the history being made 22nd June, 2023, as we deliver the fifth lecture in the ECCB at 40 lecture series taking place at the Montserrat Cultural Center. I will now welcome to the podium our moderator for the remainder of the proceedings. This phenomenon of a woman has been a journalist since she was 17 years old, finding stories in every conversation. She continues to work assiduously to spread narratives that position Caribbean people in the best and brightest lights. Quite in keeping with that mission, she created Golden Media, LLC, which manages digital lifestyle, education, and news brands, including the popular Discover Montserrat, Truly Caribbean, and Emerald Vibes TV. She is an Amazon best-selling multi-genre author who believes that everyone's unique journey is the foundation on which a legacy can be built. Her writings include Start, Grow, Thrive, Build a Business to Last, and Ordained for This, Living Fulfilled, at Peace, Provided for, and on Purpose. Of course, I am referring to Monstrat's well-renowned media and business strategist, Ms. Nerissa Golden, whom I take this opportunity to thank in advance as well for an anticipated high standard of execution of her role as moderator for the colorful economy-themed ECCB at 40 lecture series, the Montserrat edition, the promise of information and communication technology, the yellow economy. Welcome, Narissa. Thank you very much. <laughs> the pressure is on. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this remarkable, I'm already calling it remarkable because I know it will be, um, panel discussion that we're about to have. If you've been paying attention to the other sessions in the series, they've always been groundbreaking, lots of ideas and food for thought. And if you haven't had a chance to watch them, I encourage that you go to the ECCB Connect um, YouTube channel to check them all out. And so this evening, we also want to thank all of the people joining us online and on ZJB Radio tonight. You will be able, later in the conversation, in fact, from the minute we start, you can go ahead and start popping your questions into the chat, and uh, we'll be able to monitor them and offer them to our presenters later in the, the day. I would like to invite you to stand right now for the playing of the territorial song and remain standing for the invocation. Children, raise your standard 
bank on their 40th anniversary celebrations. Watch over our brothers and sisters in neighboring islands under threat from tropical storm breath. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. As Ms. Eswick said earlier, this is the fifth panel discussion in the ECCB lecture series organized to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the establishment of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. The 40th anniversary celebrations have been designed to be reflective but propulsive as we advance policy design and implementation to support transformation of the respective economies within the ECCU. At this time, please watch the monitors for opening remarks from Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Mr. Timothy Antoine. Sound effects there? <laughs> Hello, Montserrat. Greetings wherever you are in Montserrat, in the Currents Union, and around the world. As you know, this year, 2023, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is celebrating its 40th anniversary under the theme ECCB at 40, a year of reflection, celebration, and implementation. Against that backdrop, I am pleased to welcome you to this evening's lecture in our 40 anniversary series. And it is styled, The Yellow Economy, The Promise of Information Communication Technologies. Now pause for a moment and reflect how would we have survived the pandemic without the digital tools to work, to go to school, to worship, to shop, to stay in touch with family and friends at home and abroad? The power and promise of ICT. Now fast forward and think of the global economy which is increasingly digital and ask ourselves, let's ask ourselves, how will we not just survive but thrive in this economy without connectivity and the use of digital tools? It means every month's Russian must have access to information communication technologies, in particular broadband connectivity and a range of digital tools and skills to be not mere consumers, but producers, producers in the digital economy. I should also say that these technologies must work for us, not against us. So for example, artificial intelligence AI must be governed by values that serve humanity, not the technology itself. And so I wish you a wonderful lecture do enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Antoine. I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the presence of Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Quinston Buffon, thank you, and Honorable Parliamentary Sec Secretary, Veronica Dorset hector thank you for being with us. Let's jump right in. Tonight's goal is to take a critical look at the society and economy of Montserrat, and we've got two fine gentlemen to do that, with a view to identifying key hurdles and elements of a meaningful path forward. The topic tonight is the promise of information and communication technology improving the business environment. The essential questions to be asked 40 years from the establishment of the ECCB, has Montserrat leveraged the advances in technology towards an improved business environment? I'm sure you, could, you got an opinion on that. By extension, and relatedly, is Montserrat on the path towards achieving the dream of a better life for its citizens as part of the ECCU? And is digital transformation the key to unlocking Montserrat's development potential? Each panelist will make a 15-minute presentation. This will be followed by a moderated open conversation amongst the panelists and the participants. First up, 
Dr. The Honorable Samuel Joseph, educated at the University of the West Indies and Baylor University in Texas. Dr. Joseph holds a PhD in physics, a master's in computational physics, and first class honors in mathematics. He was one of the 10 students accepted into the High Energy Physics Postgraduate Diploma Program at the prestigious ICTP institution in Trieste, Italy. Dr. Joseph returned to Montserrat in 2020 as an educator at the Montserrat Secondary School and the Montserrat Community College. Believing that Montserratians could leverage their ICT skills to draw business from the global community, Dr. Joseph, along with his brother, Dr. Ja Daniel Joseph, and Manish Valecha, established Montserrat's first software company, LavaBits. LavaBits has produced various apps and software currently in use by the government of Montserrat and the Financial Services Commission. Montserrat is now part of a global world connected through technology. Its future depends on its ability to ex exploit its geothermal energy and ICTs and motivate and make use of its young people and human capital. These are all issues that Dr. Joseph has invested energies and experience toward, experience toward and, has, and has had tremendous success. Dr. Joseph is also a member of parliament. He is now deputy premier and the minister of communication, works, energy, and labor. Dr. Joseph, you're up. <laughs> Good evening. I was given 15 minutes, so let me start my clock. Uh, before I start, I would just like to also welcome Mr. Vijay and the both governors to the, this proceedings. And the topic tonight is Inform the power or the promise of information technology, and the key word is promise. And in the brief that I was sent, because I went through it carefully to try and find a loophole, and the brief I was sent, he said that we should try to make our presentations provocative in order to elicit questions. So after I saw that word, I pointed out to the moderators, they tried to take it up, but it's too late. So let's go. The topic is the promise of information technology, which implies that it's a promise is something to come. It is something that has not occurred as yet. So it's, to me, the topic is saying that we have not used Montserrat and the ECCU has not, as this point, at this point, used ICTs to leverage to improve the lives of people to the degree at which it can and that we are still falling behind because it's a promise of what ICT can do and it is not what ICT is currently doing. So yes, we have tools that do things, and we have phones, and we have software, and we have our computers at our desk, and we all do all this stuff, but has that really transformed the life of monstrations? Has that really changed the ECCU? Has it really produced a business environment in which development can occur? And because the topic, so I'm blaming the topic, because the topic said promise, I'm thinking that it says that it has not done that as yet. So the question we have to ask is why hasn't it done that? If we have all these tools and all these wonderful inventions that has been done and they're available to us and most of us in some sense can afford some of them. Most of our children have iPhones or Android phones. Most of us have computers on our desks. We have fibers to our country. We have laptops and all these fancy devices. So we have all these tools and they're already available to us. Why is it that we are implying that ICTs have not transformed the Caribbean as yet. And my thesis is that one of the problems we face as Montserrat and one of the problems we face as the OECS and the Caribbean is that we follow things. We do things because other people have done them and they have worked with them in their circumstance. And we just automatically says if that works there, it must work here if we just impose it. So it happens in our Westminster political system, other things, we just take systems that has been given to us as we came out of independence and greater self-governance and we just impose them upon ourselves and assume that what works in these other economies would automatically work in Montserrat. And there's a story that after World War II, there's this, there's this group of islands in the Pacific and they built, during the war, the Americans and the Allies would fly over and they would drop goodies and other things for the people and the people got used, the islanders got used that they would get these things. But the war ended and the ship stopped coming and the boat stopped dropping things so they were trying to figure out how to get it back. So they went and they built these fancy mics out of bamboo 
and they built these fancy airplanes and these fancy control towers and they manned it and they showed up every day. But the things never came. Because although they were doing to their, in their mind the right things, it wasn't actually why it works and why they were doing it wasn't exactly clear to them. So although we say we should digitize unless we are sure why is it that we are doing digital transformation and what's the problem that we are trying to solve and why do we have a computer on the desk in our offices and why do we have talk about producing apps unless we understand as a country, as a region, why is it that we are doing these things? It will just be a cargo cult mentality. We are just following the process because it's a process where we must follow and we're not getting the full deal. So the point I'm trying to make is a point that the governor Antoine make is that we have to reach a stage for the business environment to change and ICTs to have an effect. We have to get to a point where we are developing ourselves solutions for ourselves. Because when England transformed after the invention of the steam engine by James Watt, it was to solve a specific problem of pumping water out of the coal mines. They had a specific problem that they wanted to solve. How do I, we, as a business country, we are using coal to do our whole industrial revolution, pump water deep from a deep level in our coal, wine, coal mines, and the steam engine was invented. Not only was it invented, then you had James Watt, the inventor, working with businesses, Matthew Bolton and others, to develop modifications of how to get it done. So it's a matter of academia, business, working together to solve a specific problem. So we can import solutions and we can import payment systems and we can use Apple Pay and we can use Microsoft, but are we solving a problem specific to our region that we want to do? Have we as a region set up collaborations among member states with common problems and common solutions that we are trying to resolve so that the business environment can be improved? Or are we saying these products are available and you go to conferences and fancy presentations and they're presented to you this digital system, this ID card is what's going to solve all your problem. Get funding from IMF, FCD or somebody buy it and you will automatically be developed and you'll be fine. Your business environment would have been developed and your country would have progress. But we haven't because if you look at the data for the OECS and the data for Montserrat, and even though we're smaller than developing states and we, we can use it as excuse, we are growing slower than the other small island developing states in the rest of the world. The Caribbean as a region and the OECS is growing slower than the other regions of the, the world. We have the highest, if you look at the list of countries with debt, debt to the GDP ratio, we have one of the highest. So to answer the question, has ICTs transformed the business economy and given us the lifestyle that we want, the answer is clearly no, that it has not. Because although we are growing, you're only as fast, as my friend Honorable Fung loves to say, we're only as fast as the people that you're running with. And if everybody is going faster than you, even though you're going, you're still falling behind. And we're falling behind as a region because I'm saying and I'm positing that we haven't actually used the ICT technologies to solve the problems that we have. Yes, we have done wonderful things, and especially in the Montserrat context when we went through COVID. And because we have a huge diaspora based on our situation, I know that's something that happens. We have now reached a stage where we resume every funeral. And because we have families overseas, all monstrations watch, and this is the way that we connect back together as a community to get these things done. So in terms of that, it has, has a use. But when we consider that Dcash has been launched, and it's free, and I guarantee if you ask people in this room, do they use it, you're going to mostly get no. We have locally grown systems like Sera, and if you ask people in this room again, have, do they use it? Not, do they have it on their phone? Do they actually use it? The answer is going to come back to no, they have not. So you, it's not a cost issue because they're free, but we still don't use it. When we, during COVID, when we, the current government said that you can go to the bank and use your card to get stuff, there was a big uproar that why are you sending us to the bank to use a card when we can go inside? So if I ask us, when we're trying to change the business environment or when we're trying to change things, who are we changing it for? Are we in a culture where we like going to the bank and lime and talk to one another and go to the post office and discuss whose children is misbehaving and who don't have any manners and who's learning in school and talk about all our 
pains that we currently have in our different organs. Is that the culture of Montserrat? Is that the culture of the Caribbean? And when we try to do these solutions, are we doing solutions for the context that we want because we've been told it should be done, or are we actually trying to solve actual business problems that we have? Because if you end up in a situation where you have a hammer and you're looking for a nail, but do you have to do the solutions from the other direction? What is it that the user want? What is it that the people want? And not what they say they want, because people say they want generally sometimes it's not what they actually want, so you have to figure out what it actually is. Because I think Henry Ford was asked, if you had asked people what they wanted before the invention of the car, they would have said a faster horse. But what they really wanted was a, a way of getting from point A to point B in greater comfort, not an actual better horse. So what is the problem that we are trying to solve? So if we look at the business environment in the Caribbean and in Montserrat, if you look at the data, government is the biggest employer. Government is the one that businesses interact with. The friction in the business lies with the interaction of the citizens and the public with government. That is the biggest friction point in, I would say, in the OECS and in Montserrat. It is not consumer to consumer, consumer to business. It is the business and the consumer to government of having to go to get a stamp from one place, then having to go down to Treasury to pay the stamp, then having to come back to some other place and give them this thing to fill out, then having to come back and pick it up later. That is the true fiction point where a tax form comes to you asking you to fill out that you must give me money. Who does that? You're sending me a form and telling me to write into it how much I'm supposed to give you. That, those are the friction points that occur between in Montserrat, and those are the problems I think that needs to be fixed. So there has to be a digital transformation of government, not to fix the business environment, is to fix fundamentally how government interacts with its citizens. Because not only from the business point, but also how do they actually interact because the world has dramatically changed and is changing faster than government can keep up. So when it comes to social media, when it comes to AI, when it comes to chat GDP, when it comes to blockchain, and we're trying to regulate things that are moving faster than we can regulate, it means that we have to fundamentally change how we interact, how we regulate, how we act. So from specific things across the ECCU to wrap up, uh, the things that can actually be done and I think that can actually solve pain points. If right now I want to order something from St. Kitts or from Nevis and understand the shipping routes of how it's done, where do I go? If I want to see uh, somebody who's selling a product in Anguilla or somebody who's selling a product in St. Vincent, where do I go? There's no platform currently that connects the Caribbean islands and businesses to one another to say what is available. That just simply does not exist, but we say that we want to, to trade and we want to do things within one another. If we, you have a non, if you have a business card, a credit card, and you go to a business in the Caribbean and in Montserrat and you try to pay at the store, you're going to realize that the cashier still has to type in the, the number into a, into a machine. If you go to the U.S. or the place, you realize that does not happen, it is swipe and you go. Because there's an automatic connection between the point of sale system and the device that you use to, to pay. So there is an opportunity to develop as a region and as Montserrat these interconnections and these APIs that connect these networks together. So which goes back to the point of the steam engine. When you find these pain points, it is now, it has to be an interaction between the business, the academic community, and the government, and as a region, because we're too small with our 5, 10, and 20, and 30,000 people individually who develop these things. There has to be systems like a MIT lab, which is fundamentally set up to work with the private sector to develop solutions. But if you look at our UEs and if you look at our UTEX, do they actually do that or do they produce degrees, do they produce nothing more, producing sociologists and other such things? But somebody has to actually produce things and it cannot be a disconnect between where our societies and 
business and is set, economy set up between government and the private sector and an adversarial relationship between the private sector trying to make money, government trying to take money from them. He has the whole concept in order for us to transform our region and in order for us to change the business environment, you have to change how government views the private sector, how government interacts with its citizens and understand that we as a region, as Montserrat and as the OECS are sitting down with our actual producers and developers to develop and produce things for the region and to solve the specific pain points. And if we do that, I'm convinced that we will now be able to answer the question. It wasn't a promise. It was a promise made of ICT, and we have somebody, us, have gone through and we have kept the promise, and we have revolutionized and transformed Montserrat and the region. Thank you. Excellent opening. He was well within his time, too. <laughs> Let me just summarize a bit of what I got there. I was trying to take notes. The question is, um, have we kept up with the promise? And he said, clearly, no, we haven't. Um, he said, basically, we follow things imposed, but we are not actually solving real issues that Montserrat and the Caribbean, um, Montserrat and the ECCU have, and that it's necessary that we actually collaborate if we're going to be able to actually use ICT to its full potential. We're going to get in more into that later on, but I want to give Mr. West a chance to come and join the conversation because I know he has some more value to add. Denzel West is director of the and the, wow, is the director of the Department of Information Technology and E-Government Services in the Government of Montserrat. After graduating from the Montserrat Secondary School, Mr. West successfully completed undergraduate studies at the Barbados Community College and Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston. He has a postgraduate studies from Sheffield Hallam University, Sheffield, UK. In addition to his multinational tertiary education, Denzel has attended numerous information technology training courses across the world from Canada to Ireland to Singapore and South Korea to name a few. Having amassed quite a considerable wealth of international exposure, Denzel is uniquely qualified to advise on the development of ICTs in the region and in Montserrat, his home country. Since his return to Montserrat from his international studies in 2001, Denzel, Denzel has been the de facto chief information officer and main ICT advisor for the government. Over the past 20 years, he has managed the implementation and rollout of numerous departmental and government-wide IT applications. During this time, Mr. West was responsible for the establishment of a robust fiber optic wide area network that connects all government departments across the island to a centralized data center. During the rollout of the G1, Denzel pushed for the government of Montserrat to obtain its own block of IP addresses from Arin and bypass the local telecoms providers for this resource. This was a first for the Caribbean at the time. Starting in 2019, Denzel was the lead project manager of the major project to reconnect Montserrat to the international subsea fiber network. Apart from enabling the local telcos to use the new submarine fiber, the successful completion of the subsea fiber project now positions the government ID department as an ISP in its own right. This means that the government does not rely on the local telcos for its gigabit IP transit routes to Miami and New York. Now, now that the enabling physical IT infrastructure is in place, Denzel is now refocusing his energies on the development and rollout of a comprehensive suite of customer-facing online government applications tailored for the local and diaspora citizens and businesses of Montserrat. Mr. West. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As I sat there just now, I thought I have a problem. <laughs> I'm following two esteemed doctors to the podium, and they've pretty much said everything that I had planned to say. But then I realized that it is your problem, because <laughs> you'll have to hear it again. So once again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
I am honored to have been invited by the ECCB to deliver a lecture on the topic, The Promise of Information and Communication Technology, Improving the Business Environment. In this digital age, where technology continues to advance at an unprecedented pace, it has become imperative for businesses to leverage information and communication technology to stay competitive and thrive in an ever-evolving business landscape. In this mini lecture, I will explore the tremendous potential of ICTs in enhancing various aspects of the business environment. So let us delve into the topic by examining some key areas where ICTs have made a significant impact. Now, that opening statement was for the most part written by the online artificial intelligence application called ChatGPT, which I'm sure many of you would have been hearing about lately. I am also fairly confident that no one would have guessed who my co-author was had I not openly revealed it to you. So I could continue giving you the properly structured lecture as prepared in less than a minute by the computer algorithms, or I could have spent a little more time giving the application broader context and allowed it to further en enhance the artificially generated output. However, I am still conceited enough <laughs> to think that while computers have vastly more data points of knowledge than I do, I am still in a position to better contextualize the conversation and transmit my thoughts in a manner that should hopefully lend itself to a more engaging discussion later on. I would therefore like to suggest that to properly illuminate the topic, we should go all the way back to the original ICT promise that was prevalent in the early days of mass computerization. That is, the promise of the paperless office. We were told that with the introduction of computers, everything would be digitized. We would no longer need so much paper and we would cut down on the costs and greatly eliminate the need for printing. We did see computers on almost every desk. But along with that came a proliferation of printers that allowed for easy and convenient printing. So much so that by some estimates, the amount of paper used in offices doubled between the 1980s and the 2000s. Thankfully, the trend is now going in the other direction. As the younger generations are increasingly more comfortable reading from screens, and also partly due to the COVID-19 lockdowns where we were forced to adopt our reading habits. Estimates are that the current usage would be more than halved during the next decade. The point being that while technology did enable a different mode of operation, business processes were not altered much, and the culture of reading from paper did not change at a rapid pace either. My invitation to speak to you tonight was initiated via a phone call, followed up by an exchange of emails. Now this should have been sufficient in this age of technology, but the business process was not deemed to have been complete until a printed invitation signed by the appropriate ECCB personnel was delivered to me at my office. Tomorrow I will crumple that paper and throw it in the bin. I would therefore like to posit that the availability of technology alone is not enough to bring about improvements in the business environment. In order to leverage the power of ICTs, business managers have to make a conscious effort to dispense with old habits and streamline business processes from the ground up with the new technologies in mind. There is little point in digitizing bad processes and outdated procedures. I believe we all have a sense of what ICTs can do in terms of enhancing efficiency and productivity, facilitating global connectivity, empowering data-driven decision-making, enabling agile and flexible operations, and strengthening communication and collaboration. So the question is, are these things possible in the Monstrat context? Is Monstrat ICT ready? A few years ago, the answer to that question would have been no, or perhaps not really. 
as Montserrat did not have the type of internet connectivity that is required to fully leverage the yellow economy. Fortunately, the government of Montserrat recognized this as something that needed to be addressed. Studies showed that public funds were required to fix a market failure, and government embarked on a multi-million dollar public-private partnership funded by the FCDO to solve the internet access problem. The journey was a long one, but that is a story for another time. Suffice it to say that after the route survey in February 2019 and the submarine cable laying in June 2020, Montserrat was reconnected to the International Submarine Cable Network via a branching unit in the middle of the ocean, tapping into an existing cable that was already installed between Guadeloupe and Antigua. This means that we have transitioned from the vulnerable limited microwave connections to Antigua and now have exponential high-speed internet capacity available in Montserrat. As of October 1st, 2020, the Montserrat Cable Landing Station, owned by the government of Montserrat and operated by Southern Caribbean Fiber, went live. This resulted in a monumental leap from a combined maximum internet transit capacity of 200 megabits per second between the two telcos to an initial lit capacity of 100 gigabits per second and an installed capacity of 8.8 .8 terabits per second. By virtue of a contract between the government of Montserrat and Southern Caribbean Fiber, Montserrat now owns an undersea fiber cable connection to Guadeloupe and to Antigua. DITES now acts as the direct ISP for the government, reducing the government's internet access bill from almost a quarter of a million dollars per year for 40 megabits direct internet access service to zero recurring fees for a one gigabit per second of IP transit delivered by Southern Caribbean Fiber. We also negotiated for all schools, health clinics, community centers to be connected to the internet for free with a minimum bandwidth of 100 megabits per second. This game-changing upgrade of internet, international internet capacity is a major infrastructure pillar for the private sector investment. This increased bandwidth capacity for government has en enhanced the delivery of several online applications to include Asakuda for custom shipment clearance, online visa application, online driver's license applications, online property tax payment system, COVID-19 va vaccination verification, birth certificates, certificates online, coming soon, and various applications being delivered via the cloud. These online services are, for the most part, equipped to accept payments online. A word of caution, however. Online payments may not necessarily work for some businesses or government agencies when transaction fees are factored in. We can speak about that later. Now, while it was recognized that enabling the government and the telcos was a major step forward. The obvious question was asked, what about the local businesses and consumers? Here again, it became clear that leaving progress to the telcos in such a small market would likely mean that it would take several years for businesses and households to realize the benefits of high-speed fiber connections across the island. This led to the implementation of Project Lightspeed, a broadband fiber connection scheme that was designed to turbocharge the rollout of fiber to the premises to all inhabited areas of the island. The telcos embraced the competitive connection voucher scheme and duly executed the assignment in short order. It is important to note that the project in Montserrat did not focus only on homes passed by the fiber, but on homes connected to fiber.
Project Lightspeed achieved the goal of creating a competitive market for internet services. So while minimum download and upload speeds were set at 50 megabits per second and 25 megabits per second respectively, both telcos now offer a minimum internet access service of 100 megabits per second download and upload. These services are being delivered at prices that are below their previous minimum offers. In other words, a 100 megabits service now costs less than a 1 megabit per second service did two years ago. Research shows that the internet offerings and price points in Montserrat are competitive regionally and indeed internationally. The government of Montserrat can now boast that as a result of Project Lightspeed, Montserrat is on the verge of declaring that all internet connections in the country are high speed and fiber only. The stage has been set for the yellow economy. We can honestly declare that the internet access is not a constraint for doing business in Montserrat. So back to the discussion on how we're using the available technology. The ECCB has been promoting the reduction of physical cash transactions and is promoting the adoption of Dcash digital wallet use for mobile smartphones. Similarly, a local entrepreneur is promoting the use of a homegrown digital wallet called Sarah. Meanwhile, Bank of Montserrat continues to promote the use of their debit cards and international credit card services. I must confess that although I have just installed Dcash and Sarah on my phone, I have not loaded any money on them, and therefore I have never used them. Anecdotally, the take-up and usage of these digital wallets has been disappointingly slow. So what is the reason for this? Do we have solutions looking for a problem? Or have consumers not yet been sold on the benefits of using digital cash? There is much work for the ECCB, Sarah, and Bank of Montserrat to do if we are to realize a cashless business envir environment. Time does not permit me to go into the benefits of these digital solutions at this juncture. The lesson here is that good software applications do not automatically mean that your target audience will be immediately sold on your product. There are indeed some additional points to get for us to consider. The availability of technology on its own does not bring about change. Both speakers before me said that. Change also has to be purposeful and intentional. Change also works best if driven by a business imperative or a consumer need. So we need to identify and fill a need and avoid creating a solution without first identifying the problem. Nice to have is not always sustainable because we will always struggle for buy-in. We must also concentrate on looking for markets beyond Montserrat and create content rather than simply consume content. There is a key requirement needed for the development and realization of high value ICT opportunities in Montserrat. The missing link is reliable, low cost electricity. Time does not permit me to go into too much detail at this time, but there, put, there are potentially great synergies to be exploited if we get to the stage where we can combine the offering of affordable high speed internet with low cost electricity from our vast geothermal energy potential. Dare to dream of a large data center with its huge energy consumption requirements. That is what will make the case for geothermal, Dr. Sami. <laughs> so we see we have opportunities now for ICT systems and high-speed internet to enable telemedicine, distance education, business process outsourcing, data center and related opportunities, satellite ground station facilities, 
and many fintech opportunities. The future of Montserrat is enabled. The question is, where do you fit in? The foundations are there for Montserrat to realize its dream of being green, connected, and thriving. No more consultancies required. Read the existing updated documents, find your niche, and get to work. Let us not only use technology to enhance our in-house business processes, but also look at how we can employ information and communication technology to generate wealth in our community. In conclusion, I will refer back to the text that ChatGPT produced for me. The promise of information and communication technology in improving the business environment is undeniable. ICTs have become an integral part of modern businesses. Embracing these technologies and leveraging their full potential is crucial for organizations seeking to stay competitive, drive innovation, and thrive in today's digital age. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that this lecture has shed some light on the transformative power of ICTs in the business world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. West. <clears throat> so now the question that we must ask is, what is the business imperative? Why hasn't Mr. West needed to use Dcash or Sarah in Montserrat? How many people in here, I'll go so far as to ask, how many people in the room have downloaded the Dcash app? Okay. How many of you have actually used Dcash to make a transaction? Wow, okay, that's five out of the almost 10 of you that said you. And Sarah, do most of you know Sarah? Sarah developed by Manish Valecha. Okay, I see more hands, but still not enough. And how many of you have used Sarah to create, to do transactions? Okay, so everybody that's downloaded it has also used it. Good job. <laughs> Support local. <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> All right. So, Mr. West told us that basically we have the infrastructure that's going to set Montserrat up to use ICTs to really take us to whatever that next level is. But clearly we haven't defined where that next level is. And he's, he's basically, and you know it's his job, so he's basically trying to secure his future. And he says, I've done my job. We are well connected. Technology being connected to the global um, infrastructure is not our issue. So then, gentlemen, what is our issue? Could we get some more specifics as to how do we define where it is we want to go and then begin to create the industry, the, the, the systems that's going to do that? While you think about that answer, I want to invite you in the audience to step, to, we'll put the microphone in the center. You'll be able to step to it and ask any questions that you have. We'll also be taking questions from uh, the online community. And I know when we talk ICTs, people tend to think that um, it's all you know, three big words, right? Information, communications, technologies, and we stay away from big words and stuff. It's, it's very simple. It's about the things that help you make your life better. How can the technology that we have access to help you make more money, be healthier, connect with your family better? Do you have a question? Go right ahead. Good evening. First of all, I want to thank the two speakers. Very interesting, very different presentations, thought-provoking. The question I have is, well, let me start by positing something. So I think many of us can accept that um, IT has transformed our lives, the way we work, the way we um, live, the way we find um, a marital partner, the way we have fun. Um, clearly, we've seen the way we bury our loved ones, as somebody mentioned earlier. And I think we can also agree that there's increased um, productivity, um, some efficiencies, flexibility, work flexibility, and so on. What my concern is about the drawbacks. So um, threats to our personal privacy, 
um, cyber security, and um, loss of jobs, and in Montserrat, access to some of the devices um, and equipment that we would need to purchase in terms of the import duties and so on, whether we are creating um, a sufficiently enabling environment for that kind of um, transformation to take place. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Who wants to take it? You're both mic'd, right? Yes, I, 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 would, I would go first. I, I would just pick up on something that you said just now and just to ask you if you're certain that we're actually more productive. Because I am not 100% certain about that. Because there are some applications which have taken over some person's lives and seem to be making them less productive. Uh, so, so that's the question that's there. And that leads, leads us back to something that both Dr. Antoine and Dr. Dr. Joseph mentioned, and that is we need to move from this position where we only consume content. We have to start to think about creating content, local content for local consumption. Right? So what is it that we need or want to be sharing with each other? Okay, we have uh, Prime coming up next, next month, I think. And we have to get on the platforms and use the technology to sell the products. And the persons who are manufacturing the products have to start using the technology to make their manufacturing processes more streamlined and, and easier. Then it comes on to you. I think you started to go down the, the road of are we creating a digital divide as well? where there are lots of people who have devices, but there are also many people who don't have and cannot afford. I showed a slide earlier where I showed that the cost of the internet connectivity has not necessarily come down, but what we have is a better service for the same price. So if it wasn't affordable for somebody a few years ago, the competition that we engendered did not change the price it gave you a better service, but it is still beyond the reach of some people. So that is something that we still have to address. And Dr. Sami, also the, the, the cost of the devices, we have to address that as well, because we need to start thinking of reducing the import duty. I know Montserrat relies heavily on import duty for our budget. However, if we are to foster the development of certain things, we have to target the accessibility of devices. To, to go to your point, so to do what Danzi said, with our productivity, some phones have a feature where you could see how long you've been in it per day. I turned off mine because I didn't want to hear the truth. So I turned <laughs> off mine. <laughs> if you look at it, I guarantee that a lot of us are four, five, six hours. They're 24 hours in a day. Are we really more productive because we're on a device and ask yourself? Because some of them have also what apps you are on. So when you go through it, you see where you are. And to be honest, when we go through it, you're going to realize it's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, WhatsApp is what you're on. That's what you're on on your phone. Six hours a day, you sleep for eight, and you have other activities that you're supposed to be working for eight. If you add it up, you're going to realize that there's an overlap where it should be. <laughs> so if, are, we, are we really more productive? And then there's a fear, because the question you ask is, why haven't we adopted some of these things? But if you go through and listen to a lot of people, we do have a fear of technology, and we do have a fear of privacy to a level that I don't see other places. Where, so we have to understand why that is. So we are afraid of using our bank card. We are afraid of signing to the government system because the government now get me information. And some of it is valid because we know we say in the monster context that once your business one place, it is everywhere. And it's something that exists in a small society that once your business gets somewhere, it is everywhere. So we have a fear of sign up for any system, of putting our information anywhere, and of doing any such thing. So we have to overcome that social barrier before we could get people to use these devices. And we also have a cultural thing in Monster, which I mentioned. We want to lime on the block. It's not a matter of we are not, we do not aim for productivity. We don't define our life and we don't define our existence because we are more productive 
we define in the Caribbean and the most that we define ourselves on our relationship with other people and our liming and how we, that is how we, whether it's right or wrong is what we do. So the fact that you're more productive at work is not some sense of what you're doing, is not the function of what you're trying to do. So when you come into your business, you will sit down and talk to them and have a conversation about how they're going and other things going, despite the fact it takes an extra two minutes to process the transaction. You're not working out time for transaction and trying to move people through. Try that, and you're going to hear that you're rude and you're not friendly, and we're not going to go out the shop and other things. So we have a cultural thing that we are not always going for the productivity, we are going for other things. So that's why I said at the beginning, we have to ask ourselves, what is the problem that we are trying to solve and actually solve it? Because we're trying to say develop a system because it's fast to cash and you just come and slide your card and you go through. And you ask, why is not you? Because people do not want to slide the card and go through. They want to talk to you and ask you how you're doing and how your boyfriend and how you look fat today and how you, <laughs> they want to do it. So, so things like that is why you will see the adoption of some of these things does not happen because we assume that we are a hyper-capitalist society like America but we are not. We have social things that are more important to us than those things. Excellent point, Dr. Sami. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the fact that, you said again, the, com the need to connect. Is it that we want, we don't want money? Because you would think that if we've got access to all of this, we know what they're good for. We see other people sell to us. Why aren't we actively using these same um, tools to empower our lives and create more financial um, power impact for ourselves? It's there, so that we just we just we're happy. We don't need the money. <laughs> you see, there has to be a social transformation about. As I said, is it if it's money that we want? It means that you have to change certain things. It means you have to sleep less. It means you have to work harder. It means you have to be more productive. It means you have to be more efficient. But then you have to make a decision that you're playing dominoes left, you're lying less, and you're working harder. It's, it's a balance. So if it is that we want more money, I want our business more efficient, and go back to the point that Mrs. Lewis, they made. There's a fear also that a job in Montserrat is more important than the efficiency of the organization. So you need, if you, if you think that the ICT tool can process my taxes and do things, I'm gonna put somebody out of their work, you're not doing it. Because the person that you're putting out of their work is in your choir and goes to the school with your, with your daughter and will come to your house. Personally, it wants to ask you, how come you let me lose my job or how come this happened? So there's a fear that if you institute, and then you're gonna get it and try to institute it. If you put these things in any bank or in your business or in government, the productivity and efficiency is euphemism to you have too much people hired. And we could talk around it, but that's where you go fundamental. And there's this fear that people are going to lose their job. And it is more important to us that people have their job, even though you're more inefficient. So we have to ask, is it really true that if you put these things in place that you will lose jobs? And if you look at the industrial revolution, I think it is not true. You will just transform the society and the jobs would, the jobs will change. But more jobs will be created, so you have a reskilling and a retooling, so unless you as governments, however, convince people that we are going to reskill you, and we are going to retool you, and we are going to provide these services, you are going to get pushed back because people are not going to accept that they will lose their job. Thank you for that. Mr. Valecha. Good evening. Um, so I just want to raise two points, um, and it kind of ties into what Dr. Sami said earlier, and also just being part of the IT industry and also the business world at the same time, what I've observed is two things. Um, one, for example, we don't teach our children to be entrepreneurial. When we leave school, you're taught to find a job. get a job, mm -hmm. right? And mostly with government, <laughs> right? And if you look at just the demographics of how many new businesses um, that have been registered, you'll see there are a lot more non-nationals um, starting businesses compared to um, locals, right? So that's one thing. And that ties into another point where business, although they're in competition with, with each other, they don't compete, yes. which means um, they don't use technology or any other tools to, let's say, enhance customer service, to mm -hmm. speed up process, 
uh, whether it's to get more productivity, um, efficiency, um, or anything by that means necessary. So look at, for example, the two gas stations, um, just hypothetically speaking, is once again, are we capitalist enough to say, you know what, I'm going to transfer my station so everyone can now um, get gas 24 seven using um, a car based system. This is, this is a simple situation. So um, our other businesses, let's say in the shipping industry, saying, you know what, instead of calling me to me, hey, your delivery is ready, why can't they be at port and every single thing on the computer and instantly I get a notification and I just go and get my, um, my stuff. So we need to be, the business in industry needs to be a lot more competitive. And I guess all that kind of leads towards we're just too comfortable and we need to just get going because half the system that Mr. Wes mentioned, like the visa system was done 10 years ago in 2010 and we were once, and I think that at that time there was still a promise of ICT and we're standing 12 years later and there's still a promise of ICT regardless of having the talent on island. For that. I actually wanted to mention that, that it's been a while we've been having this conversation, Mr. West, about what Munster has already achieved and uh, we haven't seen the progress economically that really ma matches up to what we've actually already done technically. Well, it, it goes back to one of the things I said during my presentation, and that is being intentional and purposeful. The education system up to now has not been intentional and purposeful about training people to be entrepreneurs. So that is why Manish is saying that we're seeing a dearth of, of entrepreneurs in Montserrat because it is just not ingrained in us. It is not up to now, not necessarily a part of our culture. But I think it'd be a little bit unfair though for us to go too far down that road because there's some other issues. For example, uh, Mr. Valletcha mentioned the gas station and moving with te certain technologies. And that is a very apt example because from the outside looking in, I can tell that the margins for a gas station are very, very slim. The profit margins, when you spend $20 for your uh, gallon of gas, the gas station itself probably gets a dollar. Seriously, okay? So if the gas station gets a dollar out from, from a $20 sale, and by accepting your cards, maybe not Sarah and Dcash because they're fairly low cost, but if, you, if you're allowed to pay with a credit card or a debit card, and they now have to pay 4% of every transaction, that is very cost prohibitive. And I can see why a gas station would not put a, a, a card system anywhere near their doors because it just doesn't make sense economically, right? Um, somebody related a story to me uh, earlier today. That's very apt, let me just share it quickly with you. A, a country in the Eastern Caribbean, close to us, we remain unnamed, not long ago implemented a system where you could pay for a particular service online. And there was great fanfare about it. They rolled it out and now you can pay online. And I'm told that it was stopped on the first day because the department itself thought they were doing a good thing and getting savings and moving things more quickly through. But the persons looking at the money realized that the banks were taking a pound of flesh. So is government prepared to lose 4% of every transaction for a property tax payment if you're paying with a credit card, because that's what it is. So it's either that government is gonna lose 4% on every transaction, or they're gonna increase every transaction by that 4% so that consumers end up paying more. So it just doesn't quite work in our small societies. The, the, the business imperative in a larger country for using cashless transaction might be there, but in our tiny country, it is not necessarily so. One business, one business owner told me yesterday, I was at this counter, and he told me that he would prefer if everybody paid by check. Because if, we, if, we, if I swipe my card, he has to pay, I don't want to call the percentage, just in case Bank of Monsat gets mad with me. But, <laughs> but, but there's a transaction fee 
for every time the card is swiped. And he, is not, he doesn't like the fact that he has to pay the Bank of Montserrat for, in his view, nothing. So, so, so I, I just wanted Manish to, so, for us to be, don't beat ourselves up too much because there are other factors that prevent the, the, the expansion of the use of these things. And, and then to go to Manish's point, when we talk about, as Denzel said, the other factors. So when we talk about, same issue we say with the social context of Montserrat, we must understand the social context of Montserrat. Businesses don't compete with one another because we have a phrase that what's for you is for you and what's for me is what's for me. And I know you, I'm not putting you out of business. We went to school together. So we're going to understand that we're going to operate in some equilibrium that we have reached a stage where everybody's happy. You get yours, I could send my children to school. I get mine, I could send my children to school. I'm not out to put you out of business. If you're in a hyper-capitalist society, you can you say, you're out to put the other person out of business. You're finding every efficient means of operation to maximize your profits and to get better customer service and to put the other. But in some sense, in Monster, we don't. We, 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 again, we're small and we know one another. And then to the issue of entrepreneurship and the schools. So it's not just the issue of the ICTs, the way how we, everybody leaves school and you're told and you're, you're getting a government job. This is what you aspire to. And, there's a, and, and it is the right thing at the present time in Montserrat because the government pays better and the things are better than the private sector. So we, we have to be fear. The private sector is not at a stage where people is convinced if I go there, I will get the same opportunities as if I go into government. So there's something that has to be done in terms of that. There's also this, even if you start a business, we don't have a financial system that would allow you to operate, for example, like a Facebook for two years with no profits, or Amazon for 10 years with no profits, because you have some private investor and some equity firm that will put money into you, and I could spend my time and develop my product and run without profits until I get to a certain place and then switch. You need to make money right away because you have to pay the bills. And you have to be working your job, and you have to be working in government, and you have to be hustling someplace else you still have to pay the bills, you don't have a system in the OECS and Montserrat. How do I get funding to set up my business and operate for a period without having the revenue stream? To so from day one, you must have that re revenue stream. If you don't have that revenue stream from day one, you're going to be in serious. If you look at the business in Montserrat, although they started because they started with land that they had, or they started with a family connection, they had some way to do it. You'll find a few examples that actually came through from, from so as Denzi said, we can't beat up ourselves too much because there are other structural things outside of the ICT. Yes, there's a problem that we don't teach it enough in the school. Because when I first came back, and I, we tried to introduce it into one of the schools, and I remember Karina said, yes, you could do this, and you could do this programming. And I know I was told by one of the teachers, this is a good idea, and I could see the boys being interested in it. So you already have that mentality that it is certain people that should do certain things in the teaching system. And the question of whether we have the people coming through, which is why at the beginning when I came here, we started different programs. We managed to try to get a cadre of programmers through. And every person in your department, I taught them. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks for that. We have a couple of people waiting to speak. Thank you. I'm particularly interested in the question of how hard we're trying to be like everybody else. How hard we're trying to be hyper-capitalist. How hard we're trying to be connected in certain ways. I came in here, I left my phone in the car on purpose because I didn't want to be sitting in a meeting getting WhatsApp or thinking I must send somebody, I must send a message, to, a note to somebody about what Dr. Sami just said. Um, because I'm in a meeting, I'm in a lecture, I want to listen, I want to hear, I want to look around and see people's expressions when they hear what somebody says, because that's communication. And I'm 100% with Dr. Sami, it is really important that we keep this in mind when we're talking about connections. And so, the, when we talk about business, cashless business, business dealings, that's our well and good. My father used to send me to Nevis just to pick up a check because it mattered that you go and talk to somebody. So the question I have is, how do we find the balance? 
How do we ensure that we keep that balance? Because it's really important to me as a Caribbean person that I keep this. It really matters. I get annoyed when I have to go for a birth certificate, for example, and I have to go downstairs to get it done and come upstairs and then go back again and come up three days later. But when I go downstairs, I chat with a young girl in, in post office, and it, it matters. It makes a difference to me. The other thing um, I'd like to um, have someone comment on is I think the issue of us being entrepreneurial or not is uh, the, 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 it is not true that Mons Fashions are not entrepreneurial. We have always been, which is how we got to 1989, how we got to 1995 on our own feet. I think the, not I think, clearly the problem is that now we don't know where we're going. We have this amazing capacity and we have not decided how we want to use, where we want to go with it, except to be like the Americans. And that's not good enough. So what I want to ask the two gentlemen is, what other ways, besides data centers and things, how else can we use this amazing capacity to educate our children, to excite them about things? I go to China and you walk into a store anywhere and they, you literally, it's, it's cards and plastic. Do we want that? But if we, I mean, I listened to a program the other day that said, this gentleman said, um, the problem that Africans are not, we are not the children of Africa, we are the parents. And I, I, I thought about in the, in the Montserrat context, we're not the children of Montserrat, we're the parents of Montserrat. So what are we doing with our children, whether they're five years old or 50 years old, to get them to engage? How are we gonna use this to teach them to use it and to like using it without changing ourselves? Uh, I want to take that on from a slightly different angle. Um, in, in Montserrat, we, we're always looking to somebody else to do something. Always. And then when they do something and it doesn't work out or it's not quite what we want, they say, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> what's, what's the What's the system I do? But we never engage and find a way to be part of what is happening. And I say that to say that you remember I said earlier, that it was a very long journey to get to where we are in terms of the, the subsea fiber and the fiber to the home and all of that. It took me over 10 years from DFID agreeing in concept, in principle, to the project, over 10 years to finally executing it. That 10 years, I was busy fighting, making the case back and forth, planning and doing all the different things. So I was trying to build the highway, and I'm being very personal here, so forgive me for saying I. I was trying to build the highway, and people were asking me, whilst I was building the highway, what are you going to do with the highway? Well, hang on a second. When somebody's building the physical highway, that's not the person who puts the petrol station on the highway. That's not the same person who is putting the supermarket along the highway. So why are you asking, why do you think that should happen in the technology world? Okay, you see a highway being built, you know that after a certain amount of miles, people will need gas. So you go and put a highway, a, a gas station. Okay, so you've seen us over the years building the information, sup, information superhighway. What were you doing? What were people doing all this time when they knew it was coming? Okay, so it might go all the way back, as you say, Dr. Sami, to the school, because all those fine gentlemen that you, you've trained and, and ladies that you trained at the school, many of whom are with me now in, in my department, they are now the ones who are doing things. Who is coming behind? Who, who has been teaching the next generation? What is the plan? To go to Osborne, from Osborne, Osborne point, the, yes, I agree. You'll be careful to make blanket statements, so I take that back, that monstrations are not entrepreneurial. That is, I mean, they're clearly monstrations who are entrepreneurial who have done stuff. But it's a more statement in the general context of how we, how we operate and how we see things. So it's not to say that there's no monstrations that are not. But it's the point of Denzima that we have to be intentional about what we're trying to achieve because monster culture is an interconnected culture. And people are going to fight it if you try to change it. 
But to answer your question, it's going to change because, not that we want to change it, but we're going to get replaced. Because the students that come up and the people that go away to study and the generation that come back, when they come back, they're not accepting that they have to take out their cash and pay for something. They're not accepting it. So we are if you, if a, we are a divide, in some sense, is being created between, which I love to call the post, the post volcano people and the after volcano people, that we have this interconnection and we want to line and do all these other things. When people go away and study and they come back, they will complain, oh, months are still backward. I want to come down here for pay for that. And they're saying it. So we, whether we like it or not, they are going to push us out, and that system is going to come in place with the payment and the efficiency and doing all of that. So the question is another deeper question, and I agree, I know you're thinking it. Do we want that, and what are we putting in place culturally and to teach our children that the interpersonal connection and the liming is something fundamental to Montserrat, and do we really want to become, or is just as efficient as, efficiency in the terms of it doesn't business and in terms of our interactions. But uh, well, another point I want to get back to, when we talk about, I realize we're doing it, when we talk about ICT and business, we are mistaking it always. That is just ICT businesses. But there are businesses that are not ICT businesses that can use ICT. So we have to draw the distinction between the, the two. And one of the reasons I would posit why the, some of the businesses that could use it is training. Because if you talk to a lot of them, they will tell you, I don't have no time to do no QuickBooks. Time to. Because our business is in Montserrat and our entrepreneurial business, we are very small. It is one person doing it. It is one person getting up and cooking. It is one person serving it. It is one person collecting the money. It is one person going home and, and doing the cashing. And we are asking them, oh, you must go learn QuickBooks, and you must go do this. And they're not doing it. They don't have the time to do it. So that is part of the aspect. And then the bigger ones, because of the smallness of the society, you're insulated from the challenges of other businesses. So there's no imperative to, to make your thing more, except maybe you could slightly make it better to make yourself more money. And some of the things are not going to actually make more money. I know you didn't want to mention the Bank of Monster one and the same thing with the card. Because if you have a business that, say, makes $5,000 in cash a day, and you make the argument, oh, get a card and do the transaction because if somebody robs you, you will lose the money. If you make $5,000 a day and I multiply it over the year and I give you the 1.5%, I'm giving you 20 something thousand dollars. If you rob me one night for $5,000, it is cheaper <laughs> for you to rob me for the $5,000 than for me to give the bank $20,000. It is fine. <laughs> it is not a risk that we face in Montserrat. So things like that seems sensible and yes, why you don't switch to a card and it's more efficient, you're not giving up your full on 1.5% to the, another institution because for the argument is somebody, first we monster that, so that is a low risk. And even if they do rob me, it is cheaper for them to rob me than for me to put that system in place to ensure that I have my cash. And things like that we take for granted, but we actually do the calculation. So subconsciously it is done by all, the it is not worth it to do some of these things, so unless we expand and we look in, which we should, to compete overseas, and to ex then you're going to realize there's a problem, that you can't compete with overseas businesses. So until our businesses start expanding and looking to expand beyond Montserrat, we are going to have this low adoption rate of some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. Here, here. There, there's a, just before you go on, um, Ms. Ms. Osman mentioned something very early in, in her, her, her interjection there that I wanted to pick up on. She mentioned a particular issue, and everybody talks about it. When you go to get a birth certificate, you first have to go downstairs to buy a stamp at the post office to come back upstairs, right? And everybody talks now about digitization, how we're gonna fix that through ICTs and digitization. Well, hang on a second. That is not an ICT problem. That's a process problem. That is just a bad process. <laughs> Plain and simple, because the, 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 the registry department could buy 100 stamps from the post office and have you pay for it right in front of them. They could take the stamps on loan from the post office and pay, pay to the post office when they get the money. So that has nothing at all to do with ICTs and digitizing. We are in the process of doing digitization for that. 
but it's a bad business process from the beginning, and it should stop before we even get to <laughs> the, uh, the digitization. Because there, 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 are certain laws, there are certain laws that might need to be changed for us to then be collecting that, that money online. However, people should be able to pay for it in the, in the office. Same with the consular office. You go for a passport, and they send you to the treasury, all the way down in Little Bay to pay to come back up to Braids. That is a complete nonsense. That has nothing to do with technology. Thank you for that. Just to share a couple comments from online. The presentations are very insightful, thought-provoking and, provoking and informative. Indeed, we have much strides in ICT in the ECCU, but we have a lot more to do as posited by these eminent speakers. Another comment, our economies are too small. The credit card transaction fees are way too high. Yes, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I just, because my issue that I wanted to raise sort of stems from what Johnny was just saying, is about the basis of digitization. Where is the origins in the non-technology um, systems, standards, and procedures? Because if you're going to digitize and make things more efficient, it has to be, in a sense, based on efficient non-technology systems. And I use an example. Back in the day, in the early days, in transferring from voucher systems to smart stream, there used to be a standard that you have to process vouchers within three days. I mean, going straight to the treasury for payment within three days. And over the years, I've seen that standard go really down the tubes. And now, as a private sector person, it generally takes about three weeks to a month plus to get any payment. And I'm saying this has nothing to do with technology or, or digitization. You're looking at your systems and procedures within the public service systems. How efficient are they? And how are you attempting to make them more efficient? And then your digital systems would reflect those efficiencies and even give greater efficiencies. I'm like, again, even to come back to an issue like the paperless economy. I remember that was a strong mantra of a previous premier. And we saw a reflection even in government. You have the Exco truck and those things which were using less paper and more electronic systems. Um, even I myself, I went down that road because what I used to do before is to buy a printer every year because it was 40 US for a new printer because the consumables were a hundred and something dollars, so every year I would go to Puerto Rico and buy a new printer. But then afterwards, I realized, in terms of the environmental um, issues, I said, I'm going to definitely go paperless, and I have not printed an invoice for years. I've, everything is electronically done, just from your phone or your iPad, which you can take with you. So I'm saying, in part two, it all comes back to us as individuals, working with government systems, because government, in a sense, has to put the backbone of certain things in place. Because, for instance, yes, we can go online and we can order things, and it, it's going to take you, like just the other day, one transaction in eBay, it takes five weekly shipments to pack here to come, each item separated. And so you understand the cost and all those implications. Remember before when we had twin auto operations, stuff came through a Merijet, and within two days, we could have gotten stuff out of um, the US into Montserrat. And I'm seeing we, in more modern time, we're retrogressing with a lot of those things because the backbone of the non-technology side is not there to facilitate the digital side. The, the, the issues with the, um, the internet, is a huge one where, I mean, I'm so grateful and I have to commend the government, I mean, not being political, commend the government and whoever else, Johnny and the others, who really push the issue to ensure that the high-speed internet really made a difference in our lives. We see it every day and we can take advantage of the opportunities because when you go on eBay and you're, you're there, the speed that you can make that um, transaction um, with that bid, it, it makes a difference. 
So you can get a 900, what you would be a $900 uh, monitor, got it 400 and something dollars. Yeah? But then it takes months to get here, and then the custom charges. Because, <laughs> again, like a policy, the peripheral, I mean, peripherals is supposed to be supporting reduction in cost to IT um, technology. But a peripheral, if you bring in a monitor on its own, you have to pay 50 something percent. So I'm saying consistency with the non technology systems and how we move forward are significant issues. And I'd just like to get your overtures on um, some of those things. Thank you. It's the same point that, this, that Johnny made is that if you're digitizing, digitizing, you can't digitize inefficient systems, you have to make sure you digitize systems that actually work. And then certain things that exact, exist in the digital world has no correspondence in the, in the real world. So when you're thinking about what you want to digitally transform, you have to start with the assumption that everything you have does not exist. And if you were to rebuild it, how would you rebuild it and do that? And I think that's where Monsat itself and a lot of the OECs and other countries fall down. Do you have the, the will to rebuild your systems? Because government is a big ship that very hard to turn. It's like the cruise ship coming up start turning miles away to actually get where you want. And you have people in the system who have been doing things for years. And you're going to be told this is the way you work. And this is how you used to do. And we don't understand why you try. And, and that now walking away. And you're, you're bringing all kind of nonsense here. And if you think we're alone, America have anything to do with here. You're going to be told that. So you have all of these things that you have to, to, to deal with. So it's not just, if you want to actually go to the transformation that we want, so that it actually serve our people and we have our culture, other things in it, the job of selling it and the marketing, I'm going to say, is more important than the programmers that you're going to hire to do it to get the population on board that this is, as Osborne said, where are we going? And does everybody buy into where are we going? Okay, if we're going here, this is what it requires. To go here, we're gonna change this system, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do all of that. I think that's, we, so I agree with you that the systems have to be, to be looked at and it's not a panacea. I said it's not a panacea to solve a, to solve a problem. And the example I love to do, because I used to teach. We, we used to teach and you, you have your grades. After you introduce computers in the classroom, and after your students get laptops, did the grades change? And after you put whiteboards in the classroom, did the grades change? I'm going to tell her the answer is no, that the grades did not change. So the answer to the education thing clearly is not the ICT, is not just take what you used to write on the board, and instead of writing it on the board, I put it on a projector and project it on the board, and I've now introduced ICT in the classroom, and everything is solved, and my grades should go up can't happen because you've changed nothing. You've just taken a system that we know from the 60s and the 40s that doesn't work and put it. But are you willing to actually change your system now where each child have an individual computer and an individual learning thing run by an app that follows what they do and all this AI other stuff to monitor them and see what they're doing? That is what we require. We require entire rethink of the role of the teacher who's now a facilitator instead of a teacher, but we, we like to teach, we like to say we teach. We don't like to understand if the students learn and we were just there and we take credit for what they learn, but because we want to be on the board. But it requires that fundamental rethink of how you actually do things. And I think that's where we fail. We just try to, we get a project, we want laptops in the classroom, we want this, we did it, we put it out, we go and tell the public we have done this wonderful thing, we have put laptops in our classroom, we have solved the I sit in the class, but you have done, you have done nothing, and that is, and that is, I'm not going to say it from this position that you have done nothing. Thank you. I want to give uh, the FCO Director General an opportunity <laughs> to make a comment. Great. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. And, oh, okay. sorry. Uh, pleasure and an honour being here, and absolutely fantastic presentations and questions. By the way, I'm glad they're answering the questions, not me. <laughs> Um, just allow me just one comment and then uh, one question. The, the comment, I think, is on the, the transformational potential of, of ICT. You've talked a lot about transactions, and that's kind of the first stage. You can make it more efficient or not. But I do think we all face, each society, quite a challenge about which parts of global ICT do we want to adopt at all. 
So certainly you can tell I'm from the UK, but I live around the world. Um, each society is choosing and needs to choose what they want to adopt or not. And I think you both made that point really strongly. It's absolutely crucial because the transformational effect of some of this could be great, but it can be really difficult. So we don't, in the UK, want to adopt, for example, the facial recognition AI technologies that means that everyone is tracked all the time, which happen around the whole of China. Uh, really difficult, huge social effects. You can build a police state if you want to using the technology, really difficult. We may want to use some of the other technologies, but I do think it's for every group to try to work out. And this discussion, I think, has been fascinating in doing that. Work out what it is each society wants to have in the, in the ICT, and then reject some things. We don't want to have that here. It will disrupt the talk that you have. Though, actually, I've been in many um, small shops up in Yorkshire where people are famously like to talk as well. They'll swipe the card, but then they will talk to you for 10 minutes. I wouldn't worry. <laughs> it's different. That was my comment. My question's a little bit different. I mean, we're here with the ECCB, great regional uh, integration. And I just wonder what you both think about this digital integration, your incredible cable, and the connectivity you now have regionally. Many of you have mentioned the small size of the market here. I wonder how far do you think regional integration, regional markets, sharing some of these things, building a platform for the outside world to come and see how amazing things are here, how far will regional integration help with the challenges of the small market? Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I will attempt, I will attempt to, to, to say something about that. For, for many years before the, the pandemic, I was traveling the length and breadth of the Caribbean, attending meetings upon meetings about ICT. Almost every other week, I was on a plane going someplace to an ICT meeting across the whole Caribbean. You had meetings at the OECS level, you had meetings at the CARICOM level, uh, CDB level, you name it, there was a meeting. All right? I, I recall one, one year, Mrs. Greenaway is there in, in, in the audience, you, you could attest to this, where I went to Barbados three times in two weeks for ICT meetings. And they were all about the same thing and the same people in the room. Okay? So as you talk about integration, we're always there and we're always talking, but we haven't been doing a lot of stuff. It is the doing that we need to get on with. So when I look, for example, at, at the, the, the youngsters that, that Sami taught at the Montserrat Secondary School, have gone on to, um, to UTEC and come back to Montserrat, I want to put them in a concentrated group together so that they can produce something that Montserrat could then offer the rest of the region, the OECS and CARICOM. When I go, for example, when I, if many of my colleagues are around the region, some of whom might be listening now, um, I would ask of the Car CARICOM secretariat, tell me where is the center of excellence for X? So, for example, you're building a product for uh, the registry office, as we spoke about. Why is it that after all these years, Montserrat has to build one for itself. Where is the center of excellence for registry applications in CARICOM? Nobody can give me that answer because I should be able, in theory, to go and pick that and give it to my developers just to tailor, tweak it a little bit for the Montserrat context. I should not have to be building it from scratch. Similarly, with our relationship with the UK and uh, DC DCMS, Department for Culture, Media, and Sports, and their IT department, there's certain things that we should not have to be doing from scratch because you have been doing it already. So why don't we get it from where you are now? Definitely there might be need for tweaks here and there to make it local to our situation, but we should not have to reinvent the wheel every time. And that is what we find ourselves doing. But I promise you, now that we've finished with the infrastructure, we're going to move on to the soft side. And Montserrat is going to be out there with a product that can be sold to the rest of the region in short order. <laughs> it's not going to happen without the regional integration because 
just most of the small refineries, but all the other islands are small too. In the context of the global economy, in the context of everything, 20,000, 30,000 people is small. It is smaller than Yorkshire, it is smaller than a, a county in our borough, it is small. We first have to understand that the only way it's going to happen, this transformation that we want, has to be regional. And in terms of capacity, because to get things done, if you look at what created Silicon Valley and what created these areas, there are certain things that have to come together. I want to have a, a, a critical mass of like-minded people together. If you don't have that, it's difficult. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are and you're by yourself. If you don't have company, you're going to have an issue. So you need the critical mass of developers, programmers. You need the financiers around you. And you need an academic institution with you. So all of these centers that you look at, all of them are tied to something. They're tied to Stanford, they're tied to MIT, they're tied to Silicon Valley, tied to all these California schools, they're tied to Cambridge. They're tied to an institution of academics. So if you're trying to reproduce something similar in the Caribbean and the OECS, you have to put all of them together. Each individual country are not, no matter how, how you want to boast about it, because it sounds nice, are not going to have the amount of people to pull that off. So you're going to have to collaborate with Antigua, St. Kitts, and Anguilla, and we're going to have to find some way through the ECCB and ECCU. How do you connect those set of people together? Then you're going to have to put the financing with it. How do you know whether it's from the government side, private equity side, what system are you putting to put the finance into it? And then you're going to have to have it tied to an academic institution, whether it is you or you tech, intentionally that this is what we're doing and you're tied to this, you're producing the people, and we understand that we are doing things to get patents and all the whole problems with our patent system and transferring academic knowledge into practical and solve, getting academics to solve problems that we have on the ground. We don't do it, we separate the two. If you put those together, it's going to happen. But it cannot, uh, so to answer your, your question, and that can't happen in Montserrat by itself, it can't happen in Antigua itself, it can't happen in Angola itself. It has to happen on a regional level and it has to be an understanding from the higher, well it's us, the higher heads level and the higher ECCU level that we are doing this. And as Denzel said, we're very good at talking about doing it. The actual doing it is where we fall down because we have a habit of saying we're going to do it and we come back to our home countries and we go back and do our own thing because we have a local people to deal with and we forget the bigger picture that we're trying to achieve. Because in certain things like a national ID, it would make absolutely no sense for Monster to do a national ID and Antigua to do a national ID and Angola to do. You need one ID so that when I leave, we say we have a union of free movement of people. If I leave Monster with my national ID, I expect when I go Angola, I'm going to swipe it and go through the terminal. I expect when I go Antigua, I'm going to, I don't expect to have, to have these different things. So it is necessary and it has to be that these things are happening. The question is, who leads on it? And how do you decide how do you, what decisions are you having in terms of protocols, rules, data standards? So there's a whole regulatory framework that has to be done across the region that in each individual island can't do it, which is why, to answer a question that's unasked, why has Monster gone further and I'm saying these things? It is foolhardy to move forward with some of these things unless you fix some of the processes and unless you fix some of these agreement from the regional institution, you're going to end up developing systems that can only work in Montserrat, and you're going to have a problem. Thank you. A question from online. A drawback repeated by presenters and the floor is the implementation of ICT. Is our business model incorporating all the components to make the decision? Do you not, understand the question? I'm not sure I understood the question. Yeah. Um, I'll move on to the next one, because I had an issue with that one too. Who is streamlining the processes we are digitizing? Mr. West speaks about business managers, but how knowledgeable are they to leverage ICT? You see, that's the problem. You're coming at it from the wrong angle. You're thinking ICT first. first. You're supposed to be streamlining your business process that right. it makes sense. And then someone can apply ICTs to it to just enhance it and make it that much better. But your, 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 your business process needs to make sense on its own. Again, it makes no sense to move from Braids to Little Bay to complete a transaction when it's only money you're talking about. 
And I'm saying that we already have the systems in government that could take care of that. So it is not even a case of something doesn't exist. We have the capacity for there to be a cashier anywhere in any government department that can collect money for any government purpose. We, that, that system is already in place. Mr. Crump would, would attest to that. You, you can, for example, if you went to the hospital to, and you were paying for some medication, but you had an outstanding property tax bill, you can pay it at the hospital. Yes, you can. The, 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 the system is such that that is possible, right? But it may not be done because you were never told that, and the, the, and the office itself, who is responsible for collecting whatever, has never publicized those kind of things. So it's about the business processes first, and then you look at how ICT can answer the question that you are trying to solve. Yes. And, okay. and the question had in it the current business manager. Normally, we're trying to change an organization. It is normally best to get an outside view. If you're trying to solve a, a problem and you're stuck, one well, of the first things that you should do if you're trying to solve something and you're stuck, because you have your biases and you have a way of thinking, whether you think it or not, and it's very difficult to escape it out of the valley and get back in the mountain and look down. You ask somebody else what they think. Normally we tell them what we think and they ask them what they think of what we think, but you need to ask them point blank. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do they think without telling them anything? So we have to accept that it may require an outside view. These are the systems that we have. If you were to change it, I, what would you do? Then we could look at what they say and say, okay, yes, that can work, that can work. So it's sometimes not down to the people that you already have in it because you're used to it and it's efficient to you because you're used to doing it. So you know you have a bad process and you've been doing it for years. It's easy to you because you've been doing it for so long. But when somebody is trying to explain it to them and they want to know what, what nonsense it is, so it's not down to only here. You, may, you have to get an outside view. Let us see, based on what we have in Monsat and our civil service and our processes, how can it be changed and we have the right people in the room. So we have, we, we're getting close to our time to close and I wanted to make sure that we get the questions that are in the room. Jesh? Good evening everyone. Um, firstly, congratulations to the ECCB for 40 years and also congratulations for putting on this lecture. Also congratulations to Dr. Sami and also Mr. West for all your accomplishments I would say in ICT in Montserrat. Um, it has been beneficial but my question is to what extent? and at what cost? During your presentation, your initial presentation, you mentioned that, one, the government was one of the largest employers in Montserrat, correct? You also mentioned that there are some processes that can be taken online, such as the licensing departments, you know, renewal and so forth. No, my question is, when you implement those services online, you create less jobs for those in the civil servants, civil service. Maybe or maybe not. However, when it comes to our current situation as it relates to population, and you're gonna hear me speak a lot about population um, in my questions that I have. Um, so just wanna put that out there that I'm asking, would it become detrimental or is it gonna benefit us in the longer run? Mr. West, um, in your presentation, you said one of the main issues were the energy cost. I disagree. I think, again, it might come down to population because is Montreal Utilities Limited and can they afford to reduce the cost of energy? Even if we do implement renewable energy strategies, the initial cost for infrastructure is gonna be pretty high, and how are they gonna recuperate, and how are they gonna recover that cost? Miss Debbie, she mentioned, um, you know, being productive. You now, for apps such as Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, for example, there are a lot of young people here on island that actually make money doing it, me being one of them. As a member of the Dcash team here on Montserrat, I get paid to promote Dcash on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, WhatsApp. Local Den, a newly formed app. I don't think it's been officially launched as yet. I'm also the ambassador for them where I get paid to just promote their stuff. So the, these are opportunities that young people can partake in where the screen time, I guess you can be a little lenient 
with, <laughs> even though it might be on government time. Uh, maybe, maybe, no. Um, Ms. Shirley Osborne, good night. Uh, you mentioned that, are we trying to be like everyone else? Can we though? Monster has a population of, let's say, just over 4,000 people, I would assume at this point. Our neighbors in Guadalupe and Antigua, one is 100,000, one is almost 400,000. And uh, I've been to both and they're doing quite well. If we implement those strategies, it probably won't work because if I go to the bank, for example, and I forget to bring the night deposit bag, I could call Miss Fenton and say, can you please bring the bag home? I forgot it. Or if I go to John's gas station and I say, boy, me left my wallet at home, boy, tomorrow. he probably say yes. Me know Ashok for a long time ago. he probably let me go. That in Antigua, I don't think would happen. Um, you mentioned that we, said, we would say, oh, what's stupidness to do when it comes to trying something new and failing? But when we don't fail and it's successful, you have a few people that do the exact same thing, and then the market gets saturated. saturated. So I don't think there is a balance when it comes to that. Um, you also mentioned, Dr. Sami, the culture of linking up and you know, having an informal conversation. To be honest, I would much rather do this over a beer, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so that might be right, but there's also a culture of going to the bank on a Friday when you just got paid, filling up your wallet, and then thinking you have money for the rest of the month. <laughs> and when that runs out, why me broke boy, can't afford that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I think, yes, there might be a cultural issue, but I think for most part, it's just having the fact that, you know, I can go, I can see how much I have right there, so I can gauge myself for the entire month. Me doing this on a bank card, so when we go, Ashok can swipe and he reject. Ashok send open my WhatsApp. So maybe, maybe that might be a, an, an issue. My cousin, Manish, he mentioned competition and how we are in competition, but we don't compete. When we use the food industry in Montserrat as an example, taking into consideration the cost of goods and services here, as you said, you have one person doing the accounts, one person being a head chef, one person serving. Am I going to invest into making my unique selling point different to my competitors, or I'm going to try my best to stay above water when we live in an economy where the disposable income is non-existent. How many of us can afford to go outside and eat every day? Um, my last point, hopefully, um, <laughs> would be the solution. No, in order for there to be a solution, we need to get out of this loop. And this loop all leads back to the primary issue of population. When you ask the government, well, have you guys done anything to solve the population? Their response would be, we're working on it. We have a plan. Where is it? <laughs> um, and then going back to basic economics again, where I mentioned demand creates supply. Before we get into the remote workers program and we solve this energy cost and this internet con connectivity and the cost of living and access issues just getting into Montserrat, we, I think we need to focus on how we're gonna get that population here before we can sustain all those things because we can't sustain access without a population. What is a brand new hospital gonna do if there's no patients in it? Agriculture, we're not even self-sufficient as yet. So all this would be solved by this population issue. And I think once we solve that population issue, a lot of these problems would just get like a domino effect and just drop. Anyway, good night. Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, good evening, everybody. So my question surrounds the the fact that the government of Montserrat is the largest employer of persons in Montserrat and the private sector. So Dr. Sami would have mentioned that um, the government of Montserrat employs a lot of persons in Montserrat. Um, I wanted us to zero in on tech personnel coming in from university. Now, if you realize, most persons in Montserrat, they go to university through a government of Montserrat um, scholarship. 
Now, when they come back, of course, they're bonded to work for the government. So most of them, um, if they're going to work in the private sector, they have to work their government job and their job in the private sector. Um, we mentioned earlier about distractions, Instagram, Facebook, and so on. But the truth is, the 8 to 4 is also a distraction to their <laughs> private sector job. <laughs> so, so when they you know, wake up in the morning, let's assume that most persons get there for 8 o'clock. Um, then they work through the day, they have an hour for lunch, and then they leave at 4. Some persons might work extra hours. Um, now they have to go home and work on their private sector job. Now, that is not sustainable, especially when you compare it to other islands where they have a more thriving private sector and those persons don't work at eight to four job. The other thing that I want to talk about is the tax. Now, when you're working a government job and a private sector job, your second job, the private sector job, gets taxed at 30%, depending on the tax bracket that you're in. Now, that means that you have to inflate your prices. Now, you're working for the government of Monsat, you're creating a product, and you know, working for the government of Marset and selling a product to the government of Marset might be kind of a bit, a bit of murky waters. <laughs> but the problem is, the government of Marset and those institutions are the only ones that can afford the prices that you will charge, especially when you include the 30% tax. Um, so my question is, how do we incentivize persons who are working in a government job and abundant for five years to be able to do these um, private sector jobs. Now, Mr. West mentioned earlier about the fact that um, persons, the, the employees for the government of Monsat, especially those in the tech industry, can create a product. And when the government of Monsat uses it, they can sell it to other countries. Uh, the issue that I see there is sometimes we are working on a product, and the issue is not the, the skills of the persons who are doing the job, but the policies and the politics that goes into preventing that job from getting done. So when you're um, creating that product, you might take 10 years, and you have your salary. You can't sell your product to the government of Monset, and you're waiting 10 years for a product that could potentially, not even guaranteed, potentially be sold to another country. So how do we incentivize persons and create an environment for persons to be able to efficiently and effectively um, carry out their second job or whatever the case may be? <laughs> the, the, the issue raises one of the things that I mentioned in my, in my talk, in my original presentation, that the Monsat and the OECS, we don't have a mechanism of funding and of angel investors and of equity financing or development grants and the way how systems are work. So we have to talk. So I made a pitch now. Unless we get some, develop, some kind of assistance to say this is development fund, and it can be used to assist private sector businesses for their development, you're going to always have that gap that you're trying to do both jobs at the same time. So I agree that that is a problem, and I agree that there should be a, a solution to it. It has, so right now, in terms of the one issues I mentioned in terms of the copyright, I know there's a draft copyright bill that we have that I'm going to promise now, which is the promise of technology, to. to <laughs> to have discussion because it would deal with some of these issues. If you're working for the Crown and you're doing this, how is copyright, how, how, who owns it? That has to be resolved because in the monster context, you're right, the majority of people that we go train our industry will end up working for government. And if you're telling me I'm working for government and I develop a product, but government will 100% own it, one, you're going to de de whatever the word is, disincentivize me from trying to do it. So you're going to have, so there, ha there has to be frank discussion about how do we allocate your time because you're still taking taxpayers' money to do a work and we still expect that work to be done. But also we also understand you're part of the community and we need the business development for you to employ other people and generate taxes back to the government. So there's a whole loop that has to be, to be done. And it's a big problem because when I first came and I used to teach, I'm finishing teaching at five, and we're leaving from there, me, Manish, and my brother, we used to come across the room there. But we're going home at 12 because you're not know, working on your product and you're getting back up the other day for eight. And we did it for years. But it's not sustainable because I said from the inception, you have to have financing. So you're right, we have to look, we, that's us, have to put a scheme in place how either, because of the context of how we are anymore, so let's be honest, the financing you know, that is going to come to some form of government 
thing. You're gonna, we don't have angel investors, we don't have that kind of equity market, it just doesn't exist as, as yet. So there's something the ECCB and the ECCU and the central bank and the other banks need to start considering different grant schemes of how do you fund, how do you fund risky projects like that where the investment might be in 10 years or two years, ten, two years, but you can't get it now. So yes, we're gonna to have to talk the bank manager, we're gonna have conversations with him about how do you fund that with the FCD, or how do you provide development grant card? That, that is an issue. So I agree with, I'm not disagreeing, I agree that is an issue. Because I face the exact same issue, so I understand the, the issue. But the solution is what I said, is you have to have flexible working arrangements first, first from the HR perspective, and those are responsible for that. You have to have flexible working arrangements and discuss remuneration, how it would work if you're working partly at home and you're working for government. Even though you're bonded, yes, you can work from 8 to 12, and then from 12 you do this, and we change your expectations and your salary. There has to be compromises on both ends, so that's one solution. And then we have to come up with the other financing mechanism of getting the products out there. But those are in the room, the people are in the room, people are in this room who can make these decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Manish? Yeah, good evening again. So I just want to say, I think Mr. Mr. West basically just said it. Um, how do we turn that promise into actual reality? Just by doing it. Right? There's nothing else stopping us except, except that. My Sarah's um, team members work, work from roughly 8 to 4 in the UK. They have an hour train ride to go to work, hour train ride to come back. We have five minutes to get home, five minutes to come back. We have two hours compared um, from somebody else in the developing world, mm -hmm. or the developed world, to actually gain that time advantage. But we're not taking advantage of it. Mm -hmm. We have high-speed internet, even before that. How come we're not creating um, money YouTubers? And even if you're not, um, based on the, creative, um, the creator economy that's happening right now in the, in the greater world, we don't see anyone coming from the region. Why is that? I just believe that people really don't have the fire in their belly. There is, it's not strong enough. And mm -hmm. it's just, um, we're just creating excuses after excuses. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I'm this, oh, I'm that. We just need to get up and, and, and really do it. And just to, ex um, just to kind of expand on what Shirley says as to we don't know where we're going. I completely agree with her because right now we're just thinking about how do we bring services online. We have, that's like maybe 1% of information technology, well, um, IT. We still have not talked about robotics, engineering. Like, we're not even thinking on that level, or AI. Like, where, how do we get there? We're still like baby steps. So we need to start thinking broader. And to me, I think one of the, one of the things that's gonna drive that is a catalyst. Whether it's a company or an individual who's successful, who then um, just in inspires the younger generation that hey, he made a he created a unicorn company. Um, it's possible. I can do it too. Right? Because you, I mean, you can let people going home at night and still doing um, work on the internet with a regular job. People use their salary from. Um, I mean, software is cheap these days, right? You can pay $200 to get um, a video editing app, and you can go online and edit um, videos for YouTubers, right? You can go on Fiverr and do stuff. Why isn't that happening here? And I think that's a bigger question that we need to answer. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, one question on, uh, from online, and then you all will have your five minutes to wrap up. A drawback repeated is cost to implement ICT solutions such as debit cards. Is it our business models? Is our business models factoring all components to decide on the ICT solution? So, do, are the business models factoring what it's actually going to cost to to implement the solutions? In a specific with credit card, I see that one is one that we import. Import. That's a rule that was set up because of the powerfulness of Visa and these other financial companies who, who mandated that the businesses must pay, must pay that 4%, but that's not a morally rule etched into the laws of the universe. That's something somebody decided that must be done. We could say that that model doesn't work, doesn't work here. We could say if the consumer wants it, there's a slight charge to the consumer. We could say that the banks 
must absorb the cost. These are, these are decisions that somebody made. They're not etched in stone. So those business models go back to the point from the beginning. We have imported them and assumed that it has to be that way, but we could have a conversation of the business is more than not taking on that cost. It's not happening. So we have to have a conversation. How can you spread that cost across? And if government is saying we want frictionless business and we genuinely believe if there's frictionless business, it's going to increase the GDP, then it's also possible that government has to take on part of that cost. It just depends on what do we think, where, where do we want to go to go about that? Where do we want to go? If we say we want that, then it means that there may be a cost to government and to society and the taxpayers to do it because if the consumers and the voters and the society saying they want it, then it has to be paid for. Is it paid for by the banks, by the consumer, or by government, which is still the taxpayers' money? So our business models sometimes are not taking those things. The consumers assume that this has to be the model. Thank you for that. I'll let you give your first and then let, give him a moment to catch his breath. Just, just to wrap up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Thank you, everybody, for coming out and, and being a part of this exercise. I think it was a very useful exercise, and we had some vibrant conversations. Uh, just to wrap up by going back to, to where I started, we simply have to be intentional about what we're doing, I repeat, and purposeful. So once we decide that we're going to do something, we just, as Manish reiterated, need to just get on with it. We're going to find the issues with regard to uh, digital transactions and what have you. There are solutions. The banks already allow for um, what do you call ETFs, electronic trans funds transactions, EFTs. EFTs, that's, that's it. Um, so that is possible already. So if companies like LavaBits or Rovica or uh, forget the name of the other. Four Dimension. Fourth Dimension and, and those other guys. They can develop the APIs that can work to transfer the money from your bank account to government. That is entirely possible. So there's n not necessarily a need for us to use a Visa card to make a payment. We can create a payment mechanism even within Monstrat itself for our citizens to use to interact with government straight electronic tran funds transfers from your account to the government's account. That is already entirely possible. We just need to decide that that is what we're going to do and solve that problem and create the app that actually does it. We also need to go back and revisit our school curriculum and purposefully and intentionally try to train our, our next generation to do what we have not done. Some of us are not going to be able to do what we think we were <laughs> gonna, going to be doing. Our time is, is fast coming to pass, right? So, so it is the next generation that we need to be looking to. And we need to prepare them to take over and to take things to the next level. We have brought it thus far. And as I, as, as I say again, the barrier for us, we, have to, we had three access problems in Montreal. We had an air access problem, we had a sea access problem, and we had an internet access problem. We have solved the internet access problem. <laughs> the other two problems are still beyond the table to be solved, but we can piggyback on the fact that we, we, we have first world technology available to us in Montreal. What are we going to do with it? I just want to mention, uh, Nerissa, we were at a meeting a few weeks ago where the architects from the MCWL were showcasing to the public their plans for the factory shell in terms of building a innovation center, innovation center and a business incubator mm -hmm. in Brains. But there's no money. So you see they've done what they call the first phase. And the first phase is just a lab with 15 computers. And that's what we have at the moment. There are three other rooms, breakout rooms for meetings, but they're full, they're, it's being used as a storeroom at, at the moment. That's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but, but apart from that, there's a whole building that could be retrofitted and creating offices for these young startup companies. And as Dr. Joseph says, 
those companies need the breathing space so that they can grow and develop their applications without having to be generating money from day one. None of the successful companies in the world now made money from day one. All of them were loss makers. The biggest one, Amazon, I think, Amazon. took, what, 15, 20 years before he made a penny in terms of clear profit. I'm not saying that we should take that long. <laughs> However, we need to be able to give businesses in Munstrat and in the OECS some breathing space so that they can create those world-class apps that we can then sell to ourselves and to the rest of the world. Thank you for that. Dr. Sammy? Yeah. <laughs> we have to learn to fail. It's just, let's go back to the school system. One of the issues that I realize happen. We don't want to fail. If we get in a problem, you must get it right. The objective is to get it right. If you don't get it right, you're told you get it wrong. It is not the process of getting to the answer that's important, that you need to get to the answer. If you don't get it, you'll fail. And you'll be told that you're failing, you'll be given a grade, and you'll be ranked. And coming through our entire system, we've been told failing is bad. Yeah. If you have never failed, it means you haven't tried enough things. And if you don't try enough things, you can't succeed. But we are afraid to prevail, to, to grow up in that culture and the, the small society and the political culture, trying things and failing is a risk. Because if you try it and fail, you run the risk that you are not, you're, you're not going to get another job. So there's a, there's a fear of the leadership from the very top across in the Caribbean countries and the OECS and Montserrat of trying two things too different from what's normal because you fail, you'll be punished for it. So unless we start to have a culture that one, those at the leadership is willing to take risk because we agree that this is what needs to happen, we're going to be stuck in the same loop that was spoken about by, by, by Jayesh that we keep going around. So you have to do radical things and establish the image that you do radical things, which is why I do radical things and I don't care. Because unless you, unless you do it, you're not going to get to change the, the, the system. And so from the very inception, we have to be clear, was pointed by many people. We, where do we want to go in terms of ICTs? That's where we want to go, then you just do it. There's no talking about doing it. You just do it, it's as simple as that. We've decided that's what we're gonna do, you do have a consultation you need to do on the public and if everybody's with you, we want to get from this stage to this stage. You go and put the things in place and you go and do it. And you're going to fail along the way and it's okay. And that's something that we're not used to saying that you're going to fail along the way and it's okay. You're not going to ever be in a stage. If you're in a stage and the majority of things that you are doing, you succeed at, you are not challenging yourself enough. Mm -hmm. If you ever realize that you're in a stage in your life and you succeed at everything you do, you're clearly around the wrong circles and you're clearly not challenging yourself enough, you need to be failing more than you're succeeding mm -hmm. and accept that. So in terms of, and that may seem separate from the ICT conversation, but it's asking governments to do radical things. So unless the public accept that the radical things must be done and the governments accept that they're willing to risk those radical things, the promise of that transformation will not happen, it lies in the electorate and our citizenry to say we are not happy where we are. We see where the world is going and as Manish point out, we still talk, we have got left behind already. So we're now talking about digitization, that's gone. We're now talking about AI and blockchain and internet of things and we have lost. So if we're still on the digitization and we do that and we succeed, we're still, still behind. behind. So unless we're willing to <laughs> radically leapfrog some of these things and get to the other stage, and whether people understand or not, this is where we're going, we are not going to get anywhere. So in conclusion, we have to learn to be okay with failing. Thank you for that. Whew. Okay. <laughs> The promise of ICT is the possibilities that it creates for us. And the beauty of ICT is that it's not a one-way journey, it's not a one-way space. And it means that for Montserrat, we need now to consider what happens outside of our space. Where we've talked tonight about the size of our population and our economy, 
But we've got a world with 8 billion people. You don't need 8 billion people to do business with you. You may only need 100 steady clients that want what you have uniquely created. That is the possibility and the promise of ICT. And so when you begin to look around you and you think that, oh, the government needs to do that, this needs to happen, I want to suggest to you that you look inside and say, okay, where is the opportunity? And is the opportunity outside of Montserrat? Is it in Antigua? Is it in the OECS? Is it CARICOM? Is it China? Is it Korea? There are people here with brilliant ideas, but you have to stop asking permission and just go try it, get it done. That's the beauty of the technology, is that you can try it, fail, try something else, and keep going at it. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, they've given us a lot to, to think about. I'm almost heartbroken in a way too, because we've had these conversations for the last 12 years. And we are saying some of the same things. And so it saddens me that we're still having this conversation. It means we are not moving fast enough. And it also means we are missing opportunities. Someone said earlier that, um, I, I don't remember the phrase now, but basically we are so far behind. And I'm really scared for Montserrat and the ECCU and the Caribbean because we are too busy liming. We're too busy <laughs> thinking we have time. And you know, come on, we gotta get it together. We have the capacity, we're brilliant people. Let's just get to work and let's do it. I want you to stick around. There is a cocktail for those of you that are here in the building. Uh, we just want to tell you thanks for being here and for being part of the celebration with the ECCB. And for those of you who've joined us online, thank you for the comments and for watching and sharing. We appreciate you. Later this year in November, there is going to be uh, almost a month-long celebration uh, to celebrate the 40 years of this remarkable institution. So thank you very much for being here and good night, everyone. Thank you. Now that we're off, I want to say another. Yeah, Anissa Lindsay, Drayson Pompey, Shanique White, and the 40th Anniversary Committee. And the, is that CR8? CR8 team. Also the caterers, Summer Breeze, Triple J's, and Alveston House. Enjoy.
protects you and me. Yeah. In each and every uh, ECCU country. Uh, regional brilliance and vigilance. Oh, yeah. ECC before day. Side by side, we got matched with pride.